season three of the mixtape with Scott. I'm your host, Scott Cunningham. I'm a professor at Baylor University. This is season three. It's like the 75th episode. For those that are just now turning in, the mixtape with Scott is a podcast that is attempting to sort of, in the long run, be an oral history of the economics profession, not just in academia, but really the the full-blown economics profession in and outside of academia. Uh, over the last 50 years. I have certain themed people, certain themes that I'm really interested in. Those themes are econometrics, uh, which is the branch of statistics that blends with economics that we've developed over the last 100 years as a profession to uh, to basically measure the real world and uh, try to understand it better with data. Um, Causal inference, which is sort of a branch within statistics and within econometrics, uh, is also a field that I'm interested in. Uh, labor economics, economists that go into the tech industry, and the students of people like Gary Becker and probably Jim Ackman and Embens and, and Angrist and David Cart. So that's kind of the idea. Um, uh, but more specifically, it's a podcast devoted to the real stories. The real story are the, the stories of living economists, the personal stories. Uh, I firmly believe that uh, it, it's very validating and empowering to listen to a person's story. And uh, many of us have, have stories that we, we would like someone to listen to and, and we would love to learn them. And uh, that's part of the purpose of here. And also, you know, the, the thing is about these economists that we admire and we read really closely in a major way, you know, everything we know about them selects on the dependent variable. We only know their successes. We only know their, their published papers, their published books. We don't know about the, 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 the journey into those things. Uh, and yet that's where all of us live our lives. We live our lives forward, but we interact lots of times with economists backwards on their dependent variable. And that's, of course, filled with bias and probably not very helpful, uh, even from a role model point of view, very helpful from a scientific point of view, but from a role model point of view and a a map for navigating your own professional life in a way that's consistent with your values is possibly not all that helpful. That said, that's the idea. Um, And today, opening up the season three, it is my pleasure to introduce to you Richard Freeman, a labor economist that I've admired for a long, long time. at Harvard University. He's been there for a very long time. Um, and uh, he is an expert in many areas. Um, and But it was a real trip to talk to him. It was, it was so much fun. And um, uh, I learned a lot. And I just don't want to spoil anything and just want to open it up now to Dr. Freeman and let you now hear his story. So thanks so much for being uh, uh, tuned in to the podcast. Be sure to like, share, subscribe, do all that stuff, and uh, tell your friends about it. All right, see you later. Well, this is really an honor today to have a chance to to meet with uh, Dr. Richard Freeman. Uh, Dr. Freeman, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Well, I hope at the end I'll say it's a pleasure. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Hopefully so. Can you tell me right now, for the sake of the the listener, uh, who what your full title is and uh, what institutions you're currently affiliated with? Okay, I'm uh, affiliated with Harvard University. I'm the Asherman uh, Professor uh, at at Harvard. Asherman's a rich guy who gave some money. Okay, um, and I'm also the faculty co-director of the. It's, uh, Labor and uh, uh, it used to be called Labor and Work Life Program, ah. but in the current world, it's now been changed to um, Center for Economic e- Equality and Justice or something. Oh, okay, <laughs> okay. And you're the co-director that, that, of that. That's a, is that a center? It's just the law school. Oh, okay, got it. Course at Harvard, uh, the does not have centers oh it doesn't it doesn't have centers yeah so you have to a center has to be in some other entity oh okay in this case case, the law school because obviously 
labor law is real important. Right. And right. The, um, Got it. Okay. All right. Well, before we get started, I wanted to do an icebreaker. Um, can you tell me about a vacation that you took as a kid that you really think about as being one of your favorite vacations you did as a little kid? Well, let me, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you about the vacation I remember. Okay. Yeah. Do that one. Yeah. That's right. And it was in, it, it, it was somewhere in the early 50s. Um, and I was pretty little. And my parent, my father got a job in uh, New Orleans. Uh -huh. And so the family went down for four months in, it wasn't quite a vacation for my father, but for the rest of us, it was a, a vacation. And that impacted me to the nth. Um, um, first, I was struck by um, the old black, old and sort of tired looking black people in the, mm. in the city. It, it was, and I got very upset when I was supposed to sit in the, it was segregated. And so I would try to sit with the black people. Uh -huh. And the bus the bus drivers wouldn't would not allow that. Mm. Um, I I just felt I wanted to be with the people who were clearly hardworking and and struggling, right? And and, and then that's that's one event that uh, uh, is, is is very striking. Being told by the bus driver, I cannot do this. Sit with those people and not knowing what to say or do, mm -hmm. you know, in response. Um, and then I had one other event in in in, in New Orleans. Um, I went with a friend of mine, Southern kid or a white kid, um, to a movie. And the movie is it's, it's a movie called The Raid, which Van Heflin was the star. Mm -hmm. He was a, a fairly well known actor at that time, mm -hmm. and. It was about a historical event in the Civil War mm -hmm. in which a group of Southern soldiers got to Montreal mm -hmm. and decided to invade and burn down some cities in Vermont. Okay. And you know, the, the, uh, the, the Union Army was not anticipating an invasion. Uh -huh. from, um, yeah. So, okay. So, so the... The, the the scene that burnt itself in the body, into my my head was when the they when the southern soldiers came on horses with a big star and bars or whatever the, the, the confederate flag yes yeah. every white person in this audience stood up and was cheering except me uh, and i looked around and the black people who were also in the back because they were segregated, they also weren't cheering. Yeah. <laughs> and I just felt, I love New Orleans, by the way. It's one of my favorite, it was the greatest cities in the world. Yeah. But I just felt so, um, it was a part of America. I, I never, never, I never dreamed of people supporting the Confederacy. Yeah. In the, in the level of, uh, and I, I doubt that this would happen today. I, yeah, I, I, but 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 so you had a tremendous. That was my vac. That's the only vacation I remember as a kid. Wow, said, that left a big so, impression. That left a that left yes, a big impression on you. Wow. So yes. Well, so where did you grow up? Um. Well, I was I was born in a a, a really bad place, <laughs> Newburgh, New York, which is usually one of the thirty worst. Cities in America of, of, of its size. Oh, and if you look, you'll see. Um, because it, 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 it and it's near West Point, actually. It's where West Point um, is, yeah. Well, it's near, I mean, it's you know, West Point's its own land and its own, but oh. it's, it's, it's right next door to West West Point. But it was a, a place that they had a sea, uh, they, they built boats during World War II. Uh -huh. And at the end of World War II, the industry collapsed and oh. nothing fixed it. So you had a and nothing business. replaced it. So it you know, so okay. No. Yeah. What so did your dad even do? today? What did your mom and dad do for a living in that town? Oh, oh 
Well, my my dad was a, an accountant for the um, for for one of the um, shipbuilding places, presumably mm. helping them go out of business. I suppose. Oh. I don't know. I was pretty little then, and yeah. I just, so so th- then we moved to New York City. Uh, to oh, Queens. okay. Oh, in Queens, not, not, not to Manhattan, um, and then eventually to New Jersey suburbs. How long were you in Queens? I was, I was there probably, I was there for certainly junior high school mm. and for most of our public school, I would think. So I, I Newburgh, we left fairly quickly. Did you I like mean, New I'm York City? Do you like New York City a lot? Uh, I mean, that's one of the greatest cities in the world. Oh, yes, sir. I agree. <laughs> though, though, though I still like, I like New Orleans also. It's still yeah. a cool city. Um, <laughs> No, but I love New York. It was not where I lived. It was a sort of a project of you know, a project in Queens. Oh, and, and there were a lot of youth gangs, and there wasn't it wasn't a very. But the New York was getting on the subway and going to Greenwich Village. Oh man, what year was this? <laughs> what what year would this have been? Late fifties, early sixties. It's like the beat the beatniks and stuff. So you were you were in high school. During like yes. the late fifties, yeah, early sixties, yes. so this is like the yeah, beatnik. Yeah. Right? You you were in the Greenwich Village. So that would have been the beatnik riders and stuff were around, right? Yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Um, oh, so it was wow. all you know. And I was oh boy, I'm going to go to Greenwich Village. When my parents are letting me go by myself. Or oh, that must have been a, that must have been so yeah. much fun. Yeah, and in New York, as you, you said, it's just a great, great city, and uh, um. um yeah, and then I used to listen to the New York um, radio stations too, and that was also one thing why I think in New Orleans I was shocked at the, ah. at the position of black folks, because in you're in New York City you turn on the Harlem stations and you get gospel music, you get jazz, and I I had this vision of hey man black people are making tremendous things to our culture, yeah, and I'm I'm sort of felt ah. And because uh, I didn't go to, I did not go to Harlem. I went to to uh, to uh, Greenwich Village. Right, right. right, 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 right. And so then you moved to New Jersey. How come you moved to New Jersey from Queens? Uh, because my got my dad got a big raise. Oh, you got <laughs> a big could, raise. We could afford moving out of a project into a real house. Oh wow! Okay. Okay. So you graduate from high school. So, so in high school, um, whether it was in Queens or in New Jersey, what, what kind of student were you? Okay. In Queens, I was an extremely rebellious student. Okay. And I had a very mixed record, I would say. I decided at one point that school was stupid. The teachers weren't very smart. And the right thing to do was to read all these books that I could find in Greenwich Village. That was uh, the image. Oh my gosh. What were you yeah, reading? So, you were what you were reading? Uh, oh, y- y- oh yes. I was reading, uh, I'd read Hemingway. I'd read Scott Fitzgerald. It was American literature. Mostly. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's but, awesome. But but I, I also, I also would, would try to read Beckett and I wanted to read James Joyce. Anything they said, this is great stuff. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, and and I read some some science things too. So there was a you know evolution or whatever it was, mm. and, and and I would just go through these books. Thing. I get real cheap books, you know, so they're used in the used right. bookstore, right? And I think, and my goal in that period of time was I was going to read one book every day, ah. and I would sit in the class with the book underneath the desk, reading it, paying no attention. The that's the that's the greatest rebellious high school story in history. Uh, yeah, usually it's like uh, you're doing drugs, but you're reading, you know, Kerouac and Hemingway. <laughs> yes. Well, the the, the the guys who they, I didn't think they they, they took so much drugs, but uh, the, the, this was a tough neighborhood, and there were kids ah. with switchblades, and so you didn't want to deal with them. Yeah, yeah, sure. Them. And, yeah. Uh, so yeah, that was that was that was not so. That's you can see that. And, yeah. And 
I spent a lot of time in the principal's office because the teachers would say, you're not paying any attention. Mm. And you're, you should um, go sit in the principal's office. I would mm. say, fine, I'll read my book there. And, what was it? So and, what was it you were drawn to? Why were you drawn to literature, you think? What was it about literature that was attracting you so much? Uh, good question. It was just, I suppose, a different aspect of life. Mm. You're you're seeing something. Literature shows you other people, people not living in a, right. um, you know, the, 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 I also didn't, I, I rejected, uh, what is it, rock and roll. I was like, ah, that's bad. <laughs> mm. So I was against everything. And my father sometimes would say, why aren't you hanging around with the other kids? And I would say, Dad, I'm talking to Albert Einstein today in this book. <laughs> Why should I want to talk to some jerky teenage kid? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, so is it fair to say, Dr. Freeman, that you were, you've always been kind of curious about other people's lives? Because even when you were talking about in New Orleans, uh, you know, being just sort of intrigued by these African-Americans and then you're saying literature, you know, you can see how other people are living. Is that, is that been a characteristic of you? I, I think so. Yes. That, ah. and, and I always like more oddball, not fully normal people. Um, mm. So this, if there's a student who kind of is a bit weird, um, I'll take that student on. And You'll take them. that student. Yeah. Oh, uh, that's interesting. Over somebody who's who's the the the, um, uh, the little machine. You know, yeah. I've been to the best prep school. I've been to the best this. I know exactly where I'm going. I'm going to Wall Street Farm. I'm yeah. da, 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 da. in economics. We get some people like that, of course. Yeah. And and I'm much more. Oh, you're somebody who had a different kind of life, and you're so on, and you're trying to also figure out, um, you know, so for, so like the international students, I, 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 I sort of feel good about that. Right. And, and, uh, and when Harvard finally started letting in uh, black students, uh, that, that, okay. You know, I think now graduate schools, graduate students. Not the, why do you think that is? What do you think that's about Dr. Freeman? Why, why, why is it you, have this this feeling of connection with people that don't feel connected with people. Oh, well, they well, they, you know, I wouldn't say don't feel connected with people. It's do you feel connected with the society? Mm. And you can, you know, do you remember we had the McCarthy period? Yeah, there was a lot of weird stuff going on. You know, we had. President Eisenhower was great. <laughs> and in retrospect, Richard Nixon was pretty good too, actually. Mm. If, you look, if you look back at what they, they did. But there was a just a sense of, oh, the country could be better. The country should be better. Mm. And, and so the, it, it, it's, it's not people who didn't like other people because all these people would hang out together in some sense. Right. But it was in some... Uh, uh, re rebellion, I don't know if the right word, but just I, I didn't like the popular culture very much. Mm. I mean, I, I mean, I realize Elvis Presley's a great guy and all this and that. But you but were drawn I, to these, you were drawn to these people that were outsiders. Yes, yes. Oh, yes. Uh, huh. Yeah. And that was there yeah. from when you were little. Yep. From, from, yeah, from er early on, I would, I, 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 I imagine the New Orleans just slapped me in the face. Mm. That, uh, I, who, who, I, who did I feel that I wanted to be with? Mm. And it, 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 it wasn't the, the, in this case, the, the, the segregated white folk. Right, right. Well, so when you go to New Jersey, you know, uh, are you, what kind of student do your teachers say you are then? Are you still rebellious oh. then? Oh, the day I arrive in New Jersey school, I go to the principal's office and he re reads me a, a, oh. a, 
thing of saying, first of all, you're not going to be in the advanced class because I'm not having you destroy my my kids who are going to go to college. You're mm -hmm. going to go in the other class. <laughs> and I know you're, I, I, I see your record from New York. And he's really, was, and I, I, I don't remember being scared. I just remember think saying, I'm going to score the highest you ever had in this school. <laughs> I'll beat all your smart Alec ki kids. <laughs> and I was, I spent, the first year I was in the, it, it, it was not a retarded class. It's just a normal class. The right. normal class and, then, you know, go to, go to Ivy League college class kind of yeah. thing. Uh -huh. And you know, I'm in the normal class and I, you know, I'm, uh, I'm clearly a better student than anybody in the class. And I kind of started telling the kids about these really cool books and things. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so we, we, had a, we, we had a poor English teacher. She was, she was a very nice lady. But one day she says, this class has been so good. And partly it was so good because, because I also made sure that everybody saw the answers that I was giving. So everybody <laughs> recently, well, you were giving them uh, the answers to the test? Yes. Yes, they're my friends. I'm not gonna let, not gonna let my friends do badly. Do bad on the test. <laughs> so, exactly. And, and, yeah. And so then uh, I said, look, guys, I can't I can't propose that we read this book, but you guys, somebody else can. Because if I do, she, the teacher will really know what's what's up. And I was trying to read um James Joyce's Ulysses. Oh I man. Yeah. I couldn't, I couldn't read that. Yeah, it's um, tough. It's tough, yes. I still can't read it. I mean, <laughs> gotta, he, it wasn't <laughs> Finnegan's Wake, at least. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yes, exactly right. <laughs> That's exactly right. I don't think, I don't think I have a Finnegan's Wake book in my house, which meant I never thought I would read it. That. That's right, yeah. That's, uh... <laughs> <laughs> like, and so then uh, the teacher says, um, she, she sort of, I realized, I think she realized I was helping other kids do things through. She never, she never sort of went after me for cheating or, you know, doing things for the other guys, <laughs> and, 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 which would have been good because they were learning stuff. And, you know, right. they were, right. and, and right. the, the fed to, so then, then the next year, the, the, the principal calls me in and says, we're putting you in the advanced class. Now you're going to see what really good students do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I, uh, I, I, I said, okay, I'm now a junior in in high school, and I'm going to. I scored the highest of anybody in the class in my junior year. Yeah, uh, there were other real smart. There are other smart kids there too. So it's not yeah. like uh, there was uh, one girl who's clearly better in math than anybody else. Yeah. Other, you know, you, you, you got these are fairly upper class or upper middle class kids. Yeah. You know, not, 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 and, uh, and then I said, okay, I've shown it that I'm just as good as anybody else or better. And now I'm going to go back to doing what I want to do. <laughs> <laughs> But 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 at that point I wasn't going to be failing, uh, you know, not or right. I never failing. I yeah, wasn't yeah. going to be totally uh, re re rebellious. Then, um, when I went to apply for college, I wrote this story, which was the truth about how I got to be intellectual, more or less. Things uh, I've just told, yeah. Told. And my, I had an uncle who had uh, graduated from Harvard Business School. Mm. And uh, he reads the thing. He says, you're never going to get into any good school for, for this kind of thing. You're supposed to say your teachers and your parents did everything for you. <laughs> and, you know, you're supposed to show gratitude. Right. And I said, no, I'm going to tell the truth. <laughs> <laughs> and and then I got, a, 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 I'm sure this was not true, but it, I got a letter supposedly from the president of Dartmouth College. Ah. Who I saw somebody in the admissions office read my little thing and said, Hey, this is somebody we want to run with. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and, and uh, but it's signed by um, John Sloan Dickey, who was the president of the 
university. Yeah. And he said, we want you to come. We'll do all kinds of good things to you. You know, you're, you're dot, dot, dot. And um, it turns out that was, Dartmouth was at that point deciding he was no longer going to be an old, um, what is it? I don't know. Uh, he, he wanted to be intellectual. <laughs> he did. He, yeah. He to, yeah. At one point it was to drink and you go to the, the, uh, the fraternities and so they were now deciding they're going to be intellectual. And thank mm-hmm. God they have succeeded immensely nowadays. They're really outstanding. But they're, you're saying Dartmouth good. used to be more of a party school. And then when you got there, they wanted oh. to be a, a like Ivy League school? Yeah. They, well, they were Ivy League always. I mean, but they were oh. they were they were more of a party school. Oh. They, they, they were off in the woods of New Hampshire. It's yeah, it's not they're not in New York City. <laughs> right, right. There's nothing to do. It's so nothing to do, <laughs> and so there was an awful lot. But they had decided. And I, 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 when I applied, I didn't know they had decided they were going to begin to switch. Oh. Um, and they, I said, they've done a, an incredible job switching. Yeah, um, they, they now are a super place. Um, but when I was there. They weren't, uh, I would say, so super. Um, but uh, but and, and I met the, a professor in the economics department who became oh. my best friend at Dartmouth. Oh. Uh, yeah, yeah. he was Marty Siegel. He was cool. And he was in labor. And that's why I got into labor. Mm. And he, he just, and anytime there'd be a question, he would kind of start thinking about the behavior. He says, well, what kind of behavior would generate this? What kind of utility functions? What kind of, he thought like an economist. Uh, uh, and and I just, I never thought like that. Before. So I just learned. Mm. And, 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 um, and we became very, very close. So mm. I, I, yeah, and yeah, I, 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 I was spoke at his funeral. I mean, was he was a like, prominent was like a, labor? Was he a prominent labor economist at his time? Um, well, yes, but not in the upper tier. Oh, okay. He had he actually because Dartmouth was probably not a, a super place in that sense. He actually had gotten a job offer from Michigan, which oh. would have been. Michigan was very strong in labor. And I remember asking him, why didn't you take this job? And he said, I was out of Poland by the Nazis. Mm. I want to stay near the Canadian border so I can run if they come to the U.S. Really? He he meant that? He he meant it in some way, just saying I just was not up for moving. Uh I found that in Hanover, I was at peace. People were were, were nice to me. Right. And accepted me and um um and then maybe he didn't want his family to move either. I I don't know. Yeah. But that was sort of a surprising kind of mm. career choice, I would have I would have said. Mm. At that time I didn't realize, you know, that uh yeah. Because Michigan has a center of labor relations, they still do have things, they were outstanding. But he he graduated from Harvard mm. with his PhD. Mm. And he connected me up with John Dunlop, who then mm. was the uh, premier labor relations oriented labor economist. What year is that? When do you when do you meet Dunlop? Dunlop kind of when you say he hooked you up with Dunlop, that means you're at Dartmouth and there's like an introduction or you mean you go to Harvard and then you just no, I go to Harvard. Yeah, you go you yeah, go no, to Harvard. Okay. At Harvard and, and yeah, but there's a natural thing. I'm Siegel's best student. Mm. Siegel was one of um, Dunlop's best students. Um, um, Marty Siegel wrote some books in Har- or Harvard Labor series. You know, uh-huh. it was it's like schools. Um, you know, the, yeah, you, you, uh-huh. you know, the people in, in the same in the same sort of gang, same group. How old um, was Dunlop when you got there? What year was it? I'll say 65. 65? 60, something. Yeah. I didn't like him at first because uh, I was interested in the more, ma- I, at this point, I wanted to do the mathematical economics. Right. 
but um, I'm, I'm unfortunately or fortunately chief mathematical economist at uh, at Harvard then was Bob Dorfman, <laughs> and he he was not Paul Samuelson or Bob Solo at MIT, and so it didn't take didn't stick. Uh, and you mean I you took a doing... you took a course with Dorfman, and it was like it kind of you, you weren't wanting to do that stuff anymore. You weren't wanting to do the mathematical economics anymore. Yeah. Well, not with him. Not with him. <laughs> no okay. insult against him. No, no, okay. no, no insult. I mean, it just was just not. There wasn't any. I don't know, natural sort of thing. You gotta you gotta like your advisor, and you gotta kind yeah. of feel somewhere that you're on the same wavelength, right? And um, it, it, yeah, and, and then and then the, the, the economics, the labor economics that excited me at that point was the Chicago School. The Chicago School, yeah. Wait, yeah. were you? I was did you did were Becker's crime paper? Is it floating around while you're in grad school? Oh, was human capital? Was, was, his was, human was, capital was, book was out. Yeah, yeah. yeah right. No, no. Yeah. yeah. So he was my he, he was my oh my god, this guy is is super. And uh, Dunlop was not too happy about that, but there's but that was okay because you know it's kind of like it it, it didn't uh, cause you any really problems. looked up to bet you really when you were a grad student you were really looking up to Gary Becker a lot. Yep. Of yeah. Course. His human capital yeah. book, his discrimination yeah. Yeah. book. Yes, yeah. yes, because he was he was taking real problems, yeah, and putting an, enough economics onto them, yeah, that you you felt you you felt even economic theory was basically it's largely empty in some deep sense, um, um, but but but. He 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 used it to get some insights, and that yeah. was just so cool. I, mm. I saw his, yeah. Was, uh, so when I was uh, he left, was was Becker yeah. uh, was Becker a bit of an outcast at that time? You know, because I've heard no. um, I've heard sometimes that uh, you know that that people didn't always respect Becker. You know, at that earliest time. The way that he eventually became is that true or no? I, I, I don't. I, well, I don't know. I mean, I was as a student. I read this stuff and I said, "Wow!" Um, and and then, and then remember he he was at Columbia for a period mm -hmm. and then moved to Chicago. Mm -hmm. And in, in Chicago, he you know he was he, he was great. Yeah, and everybody appreciated. Yeah, uh, him. Um, Mm. So yeah. you start working with Dunlop. You start working with him. What's he like? What kind of advisor was he? He was a hands-off advisor who would tell you, well, did he think you're going in the right direction or wrong? He clearly was not a, uh, what's the right word, a, uh, uh, you know, uh, somebody with technical skills. Because, uh, you, know, you know, he's, he comes from the 1930s. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, um, and his mo he, he had this famous paper in the, I don't know, whatever it was, which the only paper that forced Keynes to retract part of the, of his, uh, of his. Really? Book. Wow. Had, it was what happens to real wages in a, um, in a re recession. Oh, in a depression. wow. And, and, and Keynes was, was thinking neoclassical. <laughs> But no, real wages were not going up in the Great Depression. Uh -huh. um, so the, the it, 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 and that was the Dunlop's first, you know, thing was. So, so I suppose you get from that, hey, you, you can sort of just look at some data, and mm -hmm. and that will help you more than doing uh, deep theory. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at your data. You then can go to the theory and interpret it, but at least you got the facts. And 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 Becker at Chicago, uh, uh, he he taught almost at least I got from him the same lesson. Uh, at, at one point when he was doing the theory of who you should marry, yeah, 
it was comparative advantage. So yeah. you, an educated person, should marry an uneducated person. Mm. Then they look at the data and it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. And yeah. so now suddenly there's a complementarity between the two <laughs> educated people in the production <laughs> function. That's and right. I thought that was awesome. Uh, <laughs> yeah, because it, 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 you could have just said, no, the, the economics is just stupid. And I'm, you know, it's the, but, but no, it was twisting the economics. Yeah, right. Evidence. Right. And, and I think he almost always did that. It was the, even though he didn't do what do you call it, he wasn't a super empirical character, but it was it was what the evidence said. And then I'll tell you a great story. Are you talking about, about Dunlop or Becker? Becker. Becker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Huh. No, 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 no. Dunlop would have said, just goes to show stupid macroeconomists. They don't know anything. <laughs> you gotta know some, you gotta know something before you talk. <laughs> and, wow. And he, and that's also something that stuck with me. Um, yeah, I don't, you don't want to be writing a paper about something and you actually have never met any of the kinds of people you're writing about. It. Totally, yeah. You, 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 it, it's, yeah, yeah. And we, we do that a, a lot. And now with the big data sets, there's a this tendency to, oh, it's big data, it'll tell you everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, but 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 well, yeah. So, some, yeah go ahead. so you did you write like a job market? What was it like back then? Was it the job market paper or was it just like a big book for your oh, dissertation? Okay, so yeah, I was not going to write any papers. I was going to write a big book. Yeah. Um. Um. And then um, so my book was the market for college trained manpower. Man, mm. because that was wasn't thinking of females at that point in the. Mm the world so this is like and what then, like 69 yeah like, we're just this, about yeah so yeah. we're just about right uh-huh yeah so somewhere around it and um it was very empirical mm. i had this cobweb cycle of oh, yeah. uh -huh. and, and it fit the data so perfectly you know it was really good uh-huh it was really oh man i got i got this and then i said well it can't i fit it for one data set that, that we shouldn't believe that. I got to go to some other data sets. Uh -huh. And other, I went to other professions. And so I had a paper, legal cobwebs, which had the same kind of phenomena. When you uh -huh. get a, a lot of students coming in, there's a two or three year lag. You, you, you go into the major, you graduate two or three years later, and then there'll be a surplus of people. You know, given that demand and the other things are, 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 are normal yeah it just just generates and then the, the cycles were very um um uh, the, uh, they, they weren't explosive cycles because mm. <laughs> that would have been inconsistent with the world they, right. they, you cycle in but you get these shortages and surpluses and, huh. and so on whatever what, happened to those cobweb um, models did they get absorbed into something else good question my friend Sherwin Rosen at one point was trying so hard to absorb them into some rational expectations model, mm. but it just didn't work and he couldn't do it. Mm. Um, um, because the rational expectations is you don't make mistakes. There shouldn't be any cobweb, right? You should just yeah, be like, that's right. it's optimal, so optimally, right? Yeah. So they're still around. Um, and you, you see, um, but but they they didn't like spawn a whole bunch of people doing cobwebs. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Once you that, did but, it, but your book was is. full of them. Your book was yeah. full of them, and you were writing a bunch of papers after you graduated. Wait, did you yeah, go to Chicago after you graduated? Oh, oh, I couldn't. Oh, yeah. Yes. Well, I actually didn't go to Chicago directly. I went first to Yale. Mm. Hey, hey, and uh, I just didn't like it at all. I mm. felt like I was back in the New Jersey school system. Yeah. Or the, the, the professors had to be called professor. And uh -huh. once I, I, I criticized, I'd forgotten who, some professor, and I was taken aside by another one and said, you know, junior faculty are not supposed to criticize professors. Mm. I thought, I'm getting out of here as fast as I can. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I just said, Chicago, here I come. Oh, I, 
I'm sorry. Thank I was looking at your, your Vita is like massive. And I was like, where is the list of all the schools? So you, how long were you at Chicago? Uh, I was at Chicago. I don't, I'm not sure now, but I would have been at maybe four years. Oh, um, 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 yeah. And, I'm, and the guy I really, I mean, obviously Becker was very influential. Yeah. Um, um, and the guy I, I also really learned an immense amount from where it was, it was uh, Greg Lewis. I was going to, this is in my, my questions. Okay. I didn't know that. All right. All right. Greg H. Greg Lewis was. H. was Greg that, Lewis. Yeah. I, I, but he did was he would go on well, one of the semesters, this Chicago was on trimester. He would go on leave one of the, or leave. And I would be in his house. So I lived in his house for, I paid him rent. Of course it was, you know, uh, uh, um, so I lived in Greg's house at different times. So I was very close to him, and, and, and he, um, yeah, and then and I, yeah, I love Chicago. I love the guys. I loved mm. everything about it. Yeah, you, you could you could criticize, you could speak up. You it was really an intellectual excitement. Mm. And the only weird thing that happened there was. I was making these comments in the macro seminar and Milton Friedman takes me aside and says, Richard, if you're going to make these kind of comments, you, you shouldn't be coming to my seminar. <laughs> well, and, and, and I, and I just said, okay, I didn't take an insult. I didn't, he wasn't like he was saying I said anything wrong. He said was the theory allows us only to see a short distance and I cannot have people looking further than the theory. What's it? What does that mean? What were you saying? Uh, I was doing behavioral economics. Oh, I was, got it. I, okay. I, but, yeah, it was, I didn't realize I was behavior. I was from, probably from Marty Siegel. I was a behavioral. So I was mm -hmm. saying, well, Milton, but people don't behave this way. Or how can you interpret this? This isn't what's going on. Even right. if your model can fit the data, it, this isn't what. So, and I'm so happy that Chicago has become a great center for behavioral stuff because right that, right 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 um, right and you were also just kind of this micro foundations of the macro models that was also you were just kind of you were you were wanting that when you were in those seminars you were wanting yes. that where are yes. the pe where are the people yeah that's the, exactly the, that's a great way right. of phrasing yeah. yeah where are the people and, and um, like one of the papers uh, that Gary wrote that I uh, thought was just awesome, I still do. It, it, it's a paper that basically says we don't need any optimizing behavior by people to get a downward sloping demand curve. Yeah, I know that paper. You, have a you like that paper? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He has, you yeah. can have uh, irrational people. You just need the That's budget. Right. right. Yeah. That's right. The budget is right. No, yeah. so that was like. Oh wow! Uh, that's <laughs> and I always teach that in, in my classes. Yeah. Always, right. but I don't think people understand that well enough. And it, it, the, yeah, uh, that, that's can be so important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you leave? Is that when you go to Harvard? You leave after four years and you go to Harvard? Yes, and and and. Uh, um, yes, I went then to, to Harvard, where I was met by um, Zvi Grillikis, who was a really? Chicago guy who had just come. Wow! He y'all uh, y'all got there at the same time? No, he was there a couple of years before. Oh, but why are they, you saying it like that? Y'all became good friends? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He kind of became. Or I was I was coming with a Chicago uh, sort of reputation <laughs> so you had to do some protection because the and, and, I, and I, now I also had the harvard protection for run up or so on but, but it was clear that some people had very oh, he was protecting you yeah because he was like oh yeah. you were going to get picked on a little bit because you had this chicago you had this oh, yeah it was you were dyed in the wool chicago a little bit well, yeah, I obviously wasn't dying in the walls, <laughs> but I was, but I was clearly these, I clearly very influenced and very, thing. yeah. And I was hired was in the year when the, the, the what's it, the er, ERPI, the Union of Radical Political Economists, oh. was, was very big. Oh, and there was a whole set of some fa faculty. Uh, 
who were very favorable to someone they didn't give tenure to. And I think I was possibly hired as sort of a, uh, uh, you know, uh, somebody who can cover the same area. But uh, was, no, that was Sam Bowles. Was, Sam Bowles. That's what I was going to ask. So wait, you're saying Sam Bowles gets denied tenure. And what does that have to do with what's going on exactly? What's this? What's this story? Well, because there was a, there was a, some division in the Harvard faculty in our uh, um, the people yeah. who yeah, you because know, Sam is really good, yeah, and 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 he's he's charismatic and he had a lot of and he took, yeah and he had lots of good stuff so, yeah, but then uh, the, but then oh was, so this I, Chicago so are you saying because <laughs> Sam gets denied tenure you're coming in from Chicago. There's some bitter faculty because it was a little bit contentious when he it was a little it was a little upset upsetting when I, he got. I mean, I do, that I don't know because I was just I came in as a you know yeah. a non tenured uh, whatever as associate professor. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and and I was always friendly with Sam. I thought he was great, and you know, it was a lot of ideas and so on. Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, he was very political too, and he spent right. time putting your things. In, in, into into that, yeah, and and then the, the people who presumably liked him must have been somewhat suspicious of me, but once I got to know them, it turns out it was, it was great. I mean, the guy who really influenced me at, at, at Harvard is Albert Hirschman. Oh, really? Huh. Yeah, I mean the Exit Voice Loyalty book. The things he was talking about in the uh, uh, economic development, it just, it was such closer to what I thought was reality. Ah. And he didn't use much math at all. Mm. Um, you know, and um, so I became very uh, friendly with him, with him. And um, I'm, I'm sure he was a big Sam Ball fan. Uh, yeah. But, but uh, uh, yeah, and, and and but but then I I yeah, girl keys and other people. So it was, so, it was so, no what are you working on at this time? Like in like it's so it's this is this would I'm trying to put the math in. So it's like 69, 74. So it's like late 70s, maybe. Um you're at Yale. How long are you at Yale? One year. So it's like then you're like for four, four years you're in Chicago, so it's like 1975 yeah. or something, 74, 75. 74 probably. Yeah, I'm trying to think because I, I wrote this, I did this and I did this particular study at Harvard. So, mm. uh, which, which is a book that um, because of the way it got published, never got any real attention mm. um, called Black Elite, which was about the black, historically black colleges. Oh, and I went, oh. Yeah, I went and visited them. Oh. And I talked to the, the people there and uh, you know, you could see me. This is the kind of people I'm going to feel good about. Yeah. And uh, I, I it, one of the, the things in the, in the book was the, uh, the 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 fact that literally the bulk of these colleges, no corporate recruiter ever appeared from the big corporations. They were like off. Oh, the map. wow. Yeah. And then you get the Civil Rights Act, and you know the sixties, nineteen. You immediately notice that you know, of course, you notice. Do they? They know it too. I'm oh, sure. they know it. Oh, they, oh, they know oh, it. No. They know it completely. What are you thinking then? You're you're immediately connecting the labor market through this missing market. Yeah, yeah. This, this well, is because this missing demand that the missing demand, missing part yeah. of the network or whatever. Yeah. And right. it, at that point. There was some discussion in sociology. Ah. The reason the black uh, folks were not um, making as much money was they yeah. all preferred to be school teachers. And preferred? I, I, yes, yes. And I, I was an economist. I said, no, nobody wants to be a school teacher. <laughs> you know, you know, we're thinking mostly college men now. So it's not matter. But I visited the, the, the Spellman, which is the girls' school there. And, Atlanta as well, um, and you, you, you know, no, it was demand. It's not supply. <laughs> it was yeah, like, this it whole was book demand. Was, yeah, it's demand. It's and demand. it was this particular institution 
within demand. It was this missing, what would it be? It's like the job fair or it's some yep, kind yep. of recruiter. Yep, they yep. Just, they just wouldn't recruit. They just they just wouldn't so recruit. The guys would come to, to campuses, you know, and you'd have a day of meeting students or whatever it would yeah. be, and you just wouldn't go. You well, what you you know, maybe guys would go you know, to Howard, let's say, or you know, so but they wouldn't go to Morehouse and they wouldn't go to Spelman and they wouldn't go. And I actually sat in on some classes I wanted to see. But, or, is, is they, and classes seemed like normal college. They weren't normal college classes. So what the hell are they not showing up yeah. for, for these these kids? Uh, and then when they do start to appear, but this is when they push the affirmative action. Um, yeah, you see the kids, boom. And they all shift out of studying education into studying business and, mm. and you know and, and, and things that will, will, will be better for their financial and economic future. Mm. Um, 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 yeah, but I wrote that as book at was book writing a big part of your career from the very, very start, books and articles where you 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 prioritized writing these because you wrote a bunch of books. You wrote yeah, a bunch yeah, of yeah, books. I yes, I prioritized books. I thought articles were stupid and Grilla Keys took me aside and said, look, um, if you don't write articles, you're not going to get promoted. Uh -huh. And articles are really the, the key thing. I said, oh, Dunlop never told me that. Uh, nobody, <laughs> he, was, he was in a different world. And I, I said, <laughs> okay, so what do I got to do? See? And so he like he says, well, I, I would say, why don't you get articles in each of the five leading journals in the next couple of years, then I can make a case for you. And <laughs> That's all you got to do. And all I have to do. And I just said, okay. And, <laughs> and I, I didn't want to do it because it means writing over and writing, rewriting and, you know, going yep. through, you're not discovering anything. Right. And, um, and, and I really lucked out. I, well, I don't realize how lucky I was. So uh -huh. the articles just got accepted, you know, so I had four or five articles coming. Were out. they kind of on this topic, this stuff that you were just telling well, me about? Yeah, well, of course they would. Do. Uh, well, some of it was some of it was reworking things in the book. Oh yeah, so, yeah. Mm. So there was I had cobwebs. I had all these things of cobwebs. Yeah, cobweb models. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, so wow. Take, take it any place. Wow. And, and then the I suppose the Brookings panel asked me. They had the Brookings as this. Um, journal, and they said, "Could you write something on blacks and civil rights?" Yeah, and I wrote something about an article, um, and that article got a lot of attention. Mm. I got a note from Paul Samuelson saying, uh, uh, "Richard, you're naive and young," and, <laughs> and and he says, "You look, you're paying too much emphasis on the data, and you're." You don't realize how deeply ingrained in America racism is. Oh, oh! And he was absolutely, you know. And my, my answer to him was, "Oh, look at the numbers. I got the numbers." Wait, you know? so wait, what is okay? I missed this. What what is it that he's what what are what are y'all talking about? I'm talking about when they first began having affirmative action programs. Oh, oh, he he was saying that. Well, so what is he saying? I, well, well, let's say what I was saying. You know, okay, I was saying. Oh my God! They put in affirmative action programs and black incomes and employment in the in the particularly areas was jumping. It went up, you know, it went up three, four, five percent relative to white. And so I just said, "Well, oh, that's it. We ended discrimination. <laughs> and it's all going to be over." Because uh, that, that's was yes. It was and Samuels, and that's where Samuels said, "Okay." Yeah, yeah. He, he he said, "No, you you." Yeah, and it, it, I, I, yeah, because that that was correct. I mean, <laughs> the numbers that I had were correct. There was a firm action had a big effect. Yeah, and, uh, when we first put it in, and really, and the and the guys were going to the schools. You, you were just seeing things happen, and right. I just said, no, this is the end of discrimination. I don't know, <laughs> ten years or so, and it'll all be gone. <laughs> and yeah, gone. yeah, and, and, which is very. Um, naive. Um, 
Sure. Yeah. In hindsight, it is. I mean, or maybe, maybe he, well, Samuelson could tell, I guess. So this, this overeducated American book, you know, I, I teach Golden and Katz's race and education technology right. book every semester. And, um, and your overeducation, overeducated American book comes out 76. And in Golden Cats, they have these really great, they're, they're really good in that book with figures. They like, they have really great figures. And, um, one fit, you know, these figures that they tell is like this declining inequality that's happening until right. around the seventies. And then this increase in inequality and, you know, they've got this skill bias, technological change story and this inequality connected to education. And so right. then I was just thinking about, you know, your book, the overeducated American coming out right at the pivot. Right. And I just right. was kind of wondering, <laughs> there you was know, what what is like what do you think what in that book is 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 catching on to what's happening okay so what i was doing is very similar to what i did with the blacks um the college premium was going down because we were graduating oodles more people mm -hmm. and i did not I, i'm very suspicious of uh uh on the uh, this uh, bias technical change. I, I remain. I think it's 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 the unmeasurable. <laughs> but <laughs> what I did was you're right. You you caught me in this. I I got the thing when it was declining the inequality. Uh huh. And so I was going to write this book and say, "Wow, we're going to pour out all these college graduates. It's going to benefit very." And it was very neo sometimes neoclassical Chicago type. Yeah. Except with my twist of this three or four years lag as the graduates. Oh, it's, it's almost kind of a got a cobwebby type thing. Yes. Right? The overeducated yes. American. Yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Wow. Now, and, and, and that was me at the, that younger period saying, oh, I see something really happening. And yeah. I know what's going on. It's that supply is changing. Uh -huh. I will assume that demand is not going to. Not changing. It, it's not going to shift in some other way. Mm. And and that's that, and that's why of course you you have to be pushing. Uh, why would why with more college graduates graduating with the would you get the twist? Yeah, the rising inequality. Well, it's got to be some demand story, which I mm -hmm. accept. Um, but I don't, I don't think we understand deeply what the demand story is. And, mm -hmm. you know, skill bias, technical change just says oh. It's shifting in the direction because the supply is still increasing. Right. So I, I, that, I, it's the only thing that'll fit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not, it's not a real measured. I'm not, I'm not saying it's wrong either. It's just, I mean, it's just not measured. You, you um, um, and, and now we may be seeing a, a reshift with yeah. um, the AI taking over some skilled jobs and and so on. And, yeah. Um, and and, and I suppose. Oh, I would, I would appreciate uh, Sanderson's comments more. Was, so you got to be real careful in economics uh -huh. about seeing something happening in a given period, which seems to be very explicable. Right. Forces could change, and we were not very good at seeing what how the forces are going to be changing. Mm -hmm. So it's. So I, I would say, you know, yes, the man shifted up, as, as, as Larry and, uh, and Claudia would, would say. Um, but uh, at, at, that, at the point when I wrote my book, there was no reason to think that was going to occur. Yeah, yeah, right, 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 yeah. right. Because those cobwebs had worked for a long time. And now all of a sudden, yep. and you're watching, you're watching what looks like almost a glut of educated people. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Wow. And, and we now have the glut of educated people yeah. in China. Oh. oh, and it's except there they don't have a, a free market. And Xi Jinping suggested they wanted to go down work on the farms or something, which is mm. which is totally insane. But the day, so the, I mean, the, the notion that if you massively increase your university population, um, you're going to have a over quote overeducated situation mm -hmm. seems correct, but mm -hmm. if you could get some shift in demand, um, yeah, the, you know, it, 
you, you can overcome that. And, right. And, and, and we, 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 uh, yeah, we, we did. I mean, the, the, the other part of the rising inequality in the country is that it's so much connected to the fall of the union movement. Yeah. Uh, and, um, uh, uh, so I did a lot of work on 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 that. Well, that's what I was gonna. I was going to, to pivot to that too, because so you you published this book in 1984. What do unions do with James Medoff? But then two years later, H. Greg Lewis publishes his book, and so I was wondering, could you tell me a little bit about you know the the similarities and the differences between those those two books at that time, and you know what. What is it that you sort of are seeing in unions? And, you know, what is Lewis's, like, I'd love to just hear a little bit about that, those two okay. books. Were they, were they friendly books or are they kind of very different from each other? I would say very different. Yes. Yeah. The first point of, 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 of what the unions do was to say, do not think of unions as a one horse something or other share that that raises wages don't think of it in that neoclassical way of just no, don't think of, yeah don't I'm, I'm very close with greg so i, I there was, you know, that's the way he thought about things mm -hmm. and that's what he was doing and i right. think it was no um that they, they affect the wage structure inside companies they they establish a where everybody gets paid in the same job classification, same wage, that has huge effects on inequality. Yeah. There's, um, and I, um, then that they had the, the big effect on the turnover, that unionized guys, independent of the high wage, don't leave. They're, oh, they're, they're, yeah. They're, yeah, lower quit rates. And that came from from uh, Hirschman, actually, the was I read when I read Exit Voice and Loyalty? He's talking about unions, and he's not talking about unions as the voice of workers. And I could not understand mm. why he missed that. How could he? He missed that. Well, I this is where you start it. getting your ideas about job job satisfaction. Yep. Yes. Yes. Oh, because if you're not leaving, you're satisfied. Yep. That's uh, where you're getting it? It's no, from no, your no, study no, of the no, union? No, our thing was the unions kept people, quote, unsatisfied. Oh, Because they're always de demanding more. <laughs> so the unions are this weird thing. You're paid more than the other workers. Yeah. You have better work conditions than other people. But the union has got to keep you focused. The boss is making more. You still got to – you um. cannot be <laughs> – Unions have to create dissatisfaction. Yes. But there must be something about the worker that's a little bit satisfied if they've got lower turnover, if they're not. Yeah, oh, yes, yes, yes. So you, you stay with you stay with the company and you fight to make it better oh. rather than you leave. Um, so it's a it's a very it's so uh, unions, as I say, they, you can't th you shouldn't think about them as this one thing that which was, which was Greg, Greg's view was, oh, get the, get the wage increase, and that's what you're doing. A lot of people in Chicago were doing the, the, the in, in that guise. And yeah. I would say, no, you got to look at all the other things that they influence, mm. and then you, you have the, you, 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 and then you have these puzzles. So this was very much, gee, why are they unhappy? Why is this job this satisfaction down? And then I, I just pulled, I would say, this is a Gary Becker kind of thing. <laughs> you say, well, I've got to tell a story that's neoclassically, you know, sort of his economics. And, and then it has to be, how are you going to get the workers to demand a higher wage next period? If the union is telling them, be happy, look, you're getting a good wage. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. And, and, it's, and it's clear, that's what unions do. They make the people, um, you know, they keep bringing up the negatives, but that's a way of making a society better or a company better. Um, you know, you, you, if you, you know, obviously you don't want to bring it up in a, in a, you know, this company stinks and we all should blow it up or something. No, right. you want to say this company stinks and we can make it better. We can and make it better. We can make it better. Um, huh. 
So when the unions start to disappear, how much how much interesting economics disappears with it? Is there like a lot of stuff you miss? Really interesting theory and interesting kinds of projects that you know just don't have a counterpart. Um, I, I in one sense I would say yes, but first I think the work showed that. Unless you have a strong union movement, you are never going to conquer inequality. And get it. We're, the, we are, we're the most unequal of the, all the advanced countries. And you have Sweden and Norway with, with strong unions, the most, the least unequal. Mm -hmm. And uh, our inequality began rising when the, as the unions were falling. Um, and I just don't, I don't see where without a strong union movement, we will ever be able to you know, seriously address in, yeah. in, inequality. Um, now, I'm, I'm, gonna st I'm starting a new project on, on unions. I haven't done anything on unions for a while, um, which is who are the most successful? What is the most successful union in the country today? Is it like NFL or something? <laughs> Well, NFL is a pretty good guess, and but by some metrics, you would be correct, I'm sure, or the actors, or something like yeah, that. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, but no, I was thinking of the one that's growing the most is the grad student union. Oh, is it really? That's growing. Yes, they are zooming, and they win the, the, the elections ninety percent. Oh, the students will vote for it. Um, um, that's, that's a couple of the most recent ones. They had the, so they are just zooming. Um, mm -hmm. uh, around, I don't know about how, how Baylor is, is, is doing with. Brad. I don't think we have one, but we 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 have. Uh, yeah, I don't think we have one. Uh, maybe we do. I need to check. We we've we've not had a. We have a master's program, but I now I've got to I've got to go check. Yeah. Oh, it's zooming, huh? New yeah. zooming as in more and more of them every year, more and yes. more unionizing across campuses every year. Yes. Yes. It's and is it across the campus or is it like focused on specific departments? No, it's it's generally across the whole campus. Oh, how long has Harvard had one? I see, but now it must be anywhere six to ten years. We we had one. I'm not exactly sure exactly sure which huh. year they voted, and MIT voted one either a year earlier or a year later. Yeah, you voted one. You go down every single school in Ma in the in the Massachusetts um, um, thing, and yeah. Well, so wait, what are you looking at? What do you, what's the outcomes that you're interested in? Well, I'm I'm interested in in how much emphasis they put on um, what their work is versus their pay. Right now, I say they're pushing pay most sharply, and then I'm wondering. And this we won't know for a number of years. If you are part of one of these unions and you are, um, let me phrase this in a nice way, you, you, you're the students I talk with. They're very, you know, this is their 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 strength. Their, this is they they really rely on this because they know they were getting the shaft. <laughs> yeah, the uh, people, um, and when they graduate and go and work elsewhere will they carry this pro union thing to other employers most of these guys are going to be on the uh, on the management side the most mm -hmm. of the, the college grads will be on the man and and will they will we then have a more uh pro um union attitude among managers i i don't know it may mm -hmm. just be that they will switch and become you know, young people are radical and old people are conservative. Right, right. And in the the other place where I've been worried about the unions, for thinking about them, in, in the South, I don't a whole bunch of Southern states, there were these huge non-union strikes and protests. Non-union. Non-union, yeah. Five, six years ago, there was m m massive activity. Huh. Um, you, and they had support, which was making incredible, of the management, of the principals, of the schools. 
because everybody was saying, you're really, we're being cut. You know, our budget is not enough for us to do. To, to pay the people to deliver services, da da, and the what struck me is all non-union. The as far as I could tell, the unions never, the organized unions never managed to touch these people, reach them. Mm-hmm. The graduate students, every single one of the unions, or almost every single one, is associated with a national union. Mm-hmm. So the UAW, which to me was the biggest shock, the UAW is the biggest, the most important graduate student union there is. And they, they uh, and then there's some teachers unions that have a, a graduate student affiliate. There's uh, some some service worker unions. So what happened is the 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 the, the official unions, you know, the sort of the, they actually came and helped the students. Um, and why they couldn't do this for the Southern um, school teachers, uh, or, or you know, may maybe that you know the South is pretty tough to be union in general, so maybe they they just couldn't. But I had the feeling they somehow they didn't adjust their product, or they adjust what they're selling, or w- whatever it happens to be. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, Whereas the students, they somehow they made it work. You know, just and it, it must be they not because the, when you talk to the students, the students, yeah, it's a democratic organization. It's not that the uh, UAW is telling the students what to do. Yeah, they're giving them advice about about issues. You know, right, right, um, and 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 that. Um, so uh, I would like to to think that maybe. The grad student unions uh, can help resuscitate some of the American. The, the more generally, it, it could have like a can th- that some of this more more unions might be. What's the biggest barrier to a to more unions forming? Then now, the are biggest, there legal barriers? No. Uh, well, the, 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 not really. Um, you 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 in the in the private sector that's where the problem is it's mm. uh, uh, the, the public sector is different the south, south southern states have different laws which you have yeah. to work through but the the, the national law says you must uh, win an election and management will pour huge resources into that election mm. and they will do everything um uh, just yeah, you know, they'll do. I mean, they'll do some honest things. I'm not gonna, but but they will do scumbag stuff too. And and all you got to do is is manage to fire a union organizer. That's against the law. But I'm not firing him or her because of their union. They have a five minute bathroom break and they took six minutes. That's the cause. Yeah. And everybody understands what's going on. And and. Because we now have the highest proportion of Americans favorable to unions that we literally have ever had. I mean, got to go back to the '60s or sometime to see. Everyone's saying, "Well, we, we need a union to, to give us, our, you know, whatever it is." Right. Um, and but the management is incredibly tough, and that's because if unless you organize an entire sector, my company, yeah. Is going to lose to your company if I get unionized. Yeah, unions take some profits away. Boom, and that's. Uh, so I was I, thinking I, it's the competitiveness of the the decentralized, or you know, the head just the deep heterogeneity and the competitiveness of the American economy seems like it's just not fertile ground for a union movement. That is correct. Yeah, um, unless it 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 it, it explodes. Um, you know, quickly. Um, um, so that you say, um, okay, we've got uh, four different supermarket chains in the area, mm. and we're organizing all four of them at once, and then we're going to establish a going wage that all of them pay. Nobody has a competitive disadvantage, and you know, so that you could see, and that's the way the that's the way the um, 
the Nordic guys and the, throughout Europe. That's how they live. Mm. You you bargain not by company. You do the vast multiple of your bargaining is by sector. Yeah, right. Right. Everybody's got to pay the sectoral wage. Yeah, exactly. It can't be by the firm. Yep. And that's why with Tesla and, uh, is having this fight with the Swedes. Mm. And, it's, he, and so uh, Musk or, or, or the Tesla management says, but we're paying the, the same wages and we're doing it good. And the, the, the answer is nope. You've got to be part of the national agreement because, well, right now maybe maybe you're paying the, the wage voluntarily, but we want you signed in. Right, right. And they have support from all of the companies too. Wow. They're saying, hey, this is the way we guarantee that somebody doesn't um, uh, uh, outcompete us by cheap labor. Do you, do you ever advise PhD students at Harvard – to uh, think about maybe maybe it's time to do a, do a dissertation on unions. Is it too early for that, or is it is it a is it a topic that you could see somebody maybe wanting to work on? Oh, I certainly could see somebody working on it. But but most of the topics I work on nowadays, I work on uh, uh, economics of science. So oh. it's a, now now that we're getting the unions. <laughs> In the graduate schools and the, and and you know science things, but that's mostly what, I, what I'm doing. That's a very different um, market. Um, yeah, and so that's what I'm mostly advising students. Yeah. And occasionally someone will come, and I can be a little bit helpful. But um, I I just think the future of the economy hinges so much on science and technology. Yeah, that we. But that's the labor market we want to um, make sure it works well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and there also, you know, you're you you tend to be we're favorable to young researchers. They're the guys who get screwed a bit of uh -huh. the current system. Um and um and there's a lot of um, what you call it. Uh, there's a lot of bad stuff going on in science. Because of the competitiveness of yeah, people. Right, the, the, right. You see, you read about frauds every few days. This guy, yeah, 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 and that, and then that says that the system is just is is being run too. It's too intense in some sense, right? Um, and yeah, so um, so that so no, that's where I, I my students are now all doing. Either that or China. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I, it, it's kind of tough. I've had you on for a little bit longer than normal. I, I've i loved this conversation. It has been just so much fun to hear your story and just to listen to you. I want to, I want to end with, with one thing. If you could, you know, imagine talking to some young person right now, some young labor economist, uh, he's in grad, he or she's in grad school, uh, maybe they're, you know, sort of way away from Cambridge. You know, they're like, uh, they're maybe sort of a middle rank school. And, and you had a chance to sort of sit down with them and kind of tell them what you think it really, uh, you know, you have a chance to tell them about what, what, what is it about being an economist that they, you know, they're going to be tempted in things that maybe don't matter, but there's parts that really, really do matter. What would you what would you sort of tell them? I I I would say don't be tempted to um to sort of copy more or less uh, with with some extra twiggles what's what's going on in the literature today. Yeah. That's not the you should find what what thing really fits you. What mm -hmm. you see, what you know with your own eyes. And then the idea is you're gonna for, you, you you got a bunch of tools, right? And to analyze that. There's data tools of huge, big data sets. We have a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. We have experimental economics now, which was not a big deal when I was there. And you you can pick something that, that that's yours. Yeah. Um, I was at uh, many uh, I don't know, fifteen years ago. I was at Xinhua in China, and they were kind of 
I don't know, they, they, they kind of wanted me to help their students or something. Mm -hmm. And I, I was asked the question like you did. Yeah. And I gave the answer. I said, don't copy what the Americans are doing. Um, and one student stands up and he says, Professor, that's very nice for you to say that. He said, but here, the, 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 they were 15 years ago, they were not very strong. Uh -huh. very much stronger. They improved. He said, I can get a good job in China if I just take the, the latest U.S. paper in one of the big journals, replicate it with Chinese data, and uh, or, you know, or say it doesn't work, but whatever it is, and, I, and, and, and I've got a good career. And he says, right. all of us, that's what we want. We right. don't want to hear you tell us, be creative, be, uh, um, take it from your own life. And I never went back to Tsinghua. I said, okay, that's fine. I appreciate it. I understood the, the reason. You know, it's conservatism in some sense, and, and uh, that, et cetera. And I thought, boy, and I, and I went back almost saying, thank God at Harvard. Nobody, I can't think any faculty would say that yeah. to students. Yeah. You know yeah. And I would say that for middle places too. Yeah. The Americans, we should say, try something that you fits you that you know something about yeah and, and that means something to you right and maybe it'll take off and you'll you'll you know get, get a, a great great uh, career maybe it won't take off but you still will have done something you know that's that's yours yep no you're speaking my love language this is uh this has been such a pleasure, Dr. Freeman. I just I, is I'm so glad I got to meet you. Thank you for taking the answer in my email. Thank you for giving me this hour. Everybody that listens to this is going to be a better person from having to listen to your story. Um, and concluding on that point means a lot to me. Thank you so much for for giving me your time. Okay. Well, thanks. I'm good. Okay. I, I did enjoy this. I wouldn't say it at the beginning. Good. Yeah, that's right. At the beginning, you, were, you, were gonna, you weren't going to tell me till the end. Good. You did enjoy it. Yes. Good. Good. All right. You have a great day. Okay. Bye-bye.